Today's a one-off event um, called Lead Like It Matters, and we're going to really, specifically, we're going to be talking about it. What is it? Because some of us have it, and some of us, some of us don't have it. So I want to ask you a question as, as, we, as we start today. Has there been a time in your life where you're closer to God than you are right now? Has there been a time in your life where you just, it seemed like God was just so close to you. You would, you would read the Bible and it seems like the verses were just popping off the pages and you're like, that's for me. And then you show up to church and guess what? The preacher is talking about that same exact verse and you're just like, God is speaking directly to me. Have you ever prayed and you just, you included God throughout your day and you prayed for the silly things. You prayed for the, the parking spot, right? And right at the very front. And guess what? You got the parking spot right at the very front. It's like God was in direct connection with you. You couldn't wait to wake up and go and spend time with God. You'd wake up and you'd go to your quiet place. You'd go and get a cup of coffee and you sit down and you open up your devotional. You open up God's word and you spend time with God and you just feel so close, so connected to God. But then, some time went by, you still believe, but it's just, just not the same. It's not the same as it was before. You still show up to church, but you've lost a little bit of that passion that you once had. You still have the light, but your light is dimmed. You had it, but it feels like you lost it. Has everyone ever felt like that? I know I definitely have. I want to show you a text from a psalmist that is very emotional. And maybe, when, maybe it's a text that you can relate with. It says this. My heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowds and the worshipers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. But yet, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? Why was I close to God then, but I'm just not now? You feel like you had it, but you lost it. Well, I wanna help you get it back today. And if you never had it, I wanna help you get it. I'm calling today's message, It Will Change Your Life. It is that relationship with God. So I want you to play along with me. Uh, if you, if you're, pick someone uh, that's sitting right next to you and say, if you don't have it, it's time to get it. Go ahead and say it to someone. If you don't have it, go ahead. I know it's weird. If you don't have it, it's time to get it. And then go to your second choice, the one you didn't choose the first time and say, you get it too. You're going to get it too. I want to talk about it. I want to talk about it. Well, see, growing up, I honestly, I never really had a wild side, um, but I know, I know that there's some wild people here in the church. If you're a wild person, go ahead, raise your hand. I, you know I like you. Yes, I like the wild, I like the wild people. But you see, I, I, I just didn't have that. I was, the very, I was the firstborn in my family, and you know, the firstborns, typically, they just stick with the rules. You know, I, I grew up going to church. My, my dad's a pastor. It felt like I grew up actually in the church itself. I was there every Sunday morning. I was there every Sunday night. I was there every Wednesday night. Some of you guys can relate to that. My parents were missionaries in Brazil. Um, I, whenever I went to university, I had to go to chapel. Believe this, I paid to go to church three times a week in my university. I had to go to chapel three times a week to graduate from my college. You know, I helped in churches. Yeah, people said, wow, exactly, yeah. I, I, I've always helped in, the, in every single church that I went to. But you see, the closest time that, if I look back in my lifetime, the closest time that I had in a relationship with God was after my college years. Uh, I was going to a church, but that wasn't really what drew me close to God. It was actually a, a small group. It was a, an equipped group that I went to, and it was me and four other guys. And every single week, we'd come together, we'd read the Bible, or we'd do a Bible study, something about living a Christian life, and then as a group of guys, we would confess our sins to each other. And what do guys struggle with the most? Everybody knows it, <laughs> it's sexual sin, right? And we would sit down every single week and we would hold each other accountable and we would confess our sexual sins to each other. Awkward, right? Super awkward. Um, and, but we would do this, but guess what happened? During the week, whenever I was tempted for something, guess what I was thinking? I was like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna see anything, I don't wanna do anything. <laughs> because if I did something, I would have to go tell my guys. And guess what happened? 
I didn't sin very much because I had to be accountable to someone else. You see, notice what I didn't say. I, I didn't say coming to church every single week made me close to God. It was that equip group that made me close to God. And so I would encourage each and every one of you, get in an equip group. Get together with a group of people that love you. It'll change your life. So that was the time I was closest to God. You see, I had it. But then as life goes on, it kinda, it's kind of like that cycle. I got to a point where I lost it. And the time where I lost it the most was actually when I moved to Dubai. Because I came here, um, it's a new city, it was a new job. My, I basically, I, I doubled my salary from what I was, when I was making in the United States. I, um, back 15 years ago when I moved here, it was much harder to find a church. And so I was looking around, it took me one year to find a church in Dubai. And during that time, I, you know, I had more non-Christian friends than I had Christian friends. And I let some of my non-Christian friends influence me in a way that actually I did some things that I'd never done before in my entire life. You see, I had it, but I lost it. And I bet I'm not the only one that lost it coming to Dubai as well. So I want to teach us three things on how to get it back from the book of Revelation. As we look up in the book of Revelation, we're gonna, John, who wrote Revelation, he spoke to the church in Sardis. You see, Sardis is kind of similar to us. Sardis thought they had it, but they didn't. Sardis was the capital city of the Lydian Empire. It's in Western Turkey, modern day Turkey today. It was one of the most powerful cities in the ancient world. And Sardis was actually known for their fruit. They had amazing fruit. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Turkey and eaten their fruit there, but me and my wife, uh, we went there many years ago before we had kids, and we loved their fruit. I don't know what it was, but we had these cherries. And it must have been like cherry season because they were big and juicy and they were just amazing. And I remember sitting, um, not even sitting, we were in a pool in the backyard of this Airbnb and we're eating these cherries and we're taking the seeds and we're throwing them in the backyard. And I still wonder today, I was like, are there cherry trees in the back of that yard? Because we must have thrown like 50 of them in the back of that yard. But it was an amazing, it was amazing fruit. You see, the city was known for its fruit but the church was not. The church was not. I don't know if you know anything about uh, spiritual fruit, but in Galatians 5, we talk about spiritual fruit. It's really love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. My wife is like trying to remind me what it, what it is. <laughs> they had lots of activity, but they didn't have much fruit to show for it. Apostle John says this, I know your deeds. He's talking to the church at Sardis. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. In other words, you have a reputation of being a Christian or you call yourself a Christian, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. You, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. You see, this, this church in Sardis, they had a reputation of being alive, but they were not. That's, I don't know if you've seen this, but I've seen many Christians, and maybe I've been this way as well. Outwardly, you're spiritually busy, right? You're showing up to church, you're going to the Bible studies, you're singing the Christian song, you're listening to the Christian radio, right? You knew all the words to blend in, to fit in, but not enough Jesus to actually change your life. You see the church there in Sardis, they looked like they had it, but they didn't. They were playing church. And that's one of the things that I say here at Mosaic is we're not gonna play church. We don't have time to play church. We're gonna keep it real. So Sardis is this ancient city in, 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 uh, in Turkey. And many of the um, cities of that time, of the ancient times, they had Acropolis and an Acropolis. An Acropolis is essentially a fortress that's on a mountain. It's, it's, it's a fortress on a mountaintop or a castle. This is a depiction of, I think, believe the, um, the Acropolis in Athens, Greece. 
It seemed almost um, impenetrable. You see, this Sardis, at their Acropolis, it had a steep wall and then down a steep mountain, and at the very bottom of the mountain was a river. So it was like a moat. It was almost impenetrable, except it wasn't. Here's a true story. In 549 BC, a soldier was up on top of the wall. His, his helmet somehow got knocked off, and it fell down, down the, the stone castle walls, down this steep mountain to the river below. You know, you imagine in these times, these helmets, he didn't want to get in trouble, so what, is, what does a good soldier do? He goes down and gets his helmet, right? So he scales down the wall of the castle. He scales down this steep hill and goes down and gets his helmet. And then what does he do? He's like, I got to get back up. So he climbs back up the steep mountain, scales the wall of the, of the castle, and gets back inside. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, his enemies saw him do it, and they're like, hmm, so that's how you get up into the castle. In the middle of the night, a short while later, Midian soldiers scaled the walls while the guards were asleep, and they were defeated because they were complacent. They were comfortable. They let their guard down, and they were asleep. That's why Jesus is telling some of us here today that we need to wake up. We need to hear this message from God. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. So what do you do? What do you do when you realize that you're not as close to God as you used to? Well, I'm going to give you three things from the book of Revelation that John's going to help us with. Here's the first thing. The first is you got to remember it. You got to remember it. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. You see, remember here, this word remember, it's in the, Greek, in the Greek language, it's in the present imperative. It means to keep on remembering, to go on remembering, to, to don't forget, to bring it to the top of your mind. It's much like the psalmist said in Psalm 77. But then I recall all you have done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. See, some of you here today, you need to remember what it was like before you had Christ. You need to think back before he changed your life. You need to remember those times when you felt lost, when you felt hopeless, without hope. You need to remember those times when you were hung over and you're saying to yourself, I'm never going to do that again. And then the next week you're just there doing it again. You need to remember when you were in all sorts of pain and no one was there for you. And then some of us here in the room, we need to remember when we became Christians. We need to remember when we allowed God to come into our life. We need to remember when he answered that prayer. We need to remember when he carried you through that depression. We need to remember when uh, you were all alone and God sent someone to be with you. And God sent someone to care for you. You need to remember when there was no money in the bank and then God showed up and gave you money unexpectedly from someone else. Uh, my dad tells a story, and I'm probably gonna get this wrong. I'm, I'm kind of going by memory. I forgot to ask you before the sermon, dad. But I remember my, my dad telling a story when we were young, when I was young. They had just moved to a new city. And I guess it was on the weekend. This is prior to ATMs where you could just pull out money. It was on the weekend and the banks were closed and I, got, I was sick. I needed to go to the hospital. And dad didn't have money with him to pay for, to take me to the doctor. And uh, he's starting out new in the ministry. This is very early on in his ministry. And he said, God, um, he prayed. He said, God, I'm a, I'm a minister for you. And my son is sick, and I need to take him to the doctor, and I don't have any money. I need you to provide for me. How can I go and tell other people as a minister that you're going to provide for them if you don't provide for me, God? And I need you to give me $25 so I can take my kid to the doctor. The next day, I believe, someone from church comes up and gives him $25. They said, I don't know why I'm supposed to give you this, but I just feel like God is supposed to, I'm supposed to give you this $25. And then he goes and he opens up the mailbox for that day. And, and you know, whenever mail back, 
50 years ago, whatever, 40 something years ago, however long this was, you know, it takes time for the mail. Like in the mail, he opened up the mail and there was another check in there for $25. God gave him double of what he asked for. Yeah, praise God, praise God. Some of you, some of you need to look back. And some of you need to remember what God has done in your life. Some of you have lost it. You need to remember it. That's the first thing, remember it. The second thing, you need to finish it. You need to finish it. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. Now watch what he says. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Some of you had it. Some of you lost it. And you're wondering, where did it go? Where did it go? For some of you here today, the reason why you've lost it, maybe, maybe it's because God told you to do something and you didn't do it. Maybe he told you to give something. You saw someone in need, you saw someone that needed help, and you felt this tug on your heart to go and help, and you didn't do it. Maybe it's because he told you to confess that hidden sin that you've been hiding for so long. Guys, put it on your heart that you need to confess it. You haven't done it. Maybe it's because he told you to trust him, and you just continue to hold tight with all of your might because you're in control and you know best. Maybe it's because he told you to break up with that guy because your mama don't like him, your two best friends don't like him, your whole family members don't like him, your relatives don't like him, and you deserve more than a fixer-upper. God's got something better for you. You need to finish the work. Some of us here, we need to make the call. Some of us need to apologize. Some of us need to throw away that bad habit. Can you imagine? I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I've thought about this, but how much or how, what blessings have you missed out on because you didn't do what God told you to do? What have you missed out on because you didn't do what God told you to do? You need to finish it. Now, if you had it and you lost it, you gotta remember it, it's the first thing. The second is finish it, and here's the third thing. You need to hold it. You need to hold it. You need to hold it tight. You need to hold it close. Because what do you do with things that are important to you? You hold them tight, right? You never take them for granted. John says, remember, therefore, what you received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. What is important to you that you need to hold? Hold it close. I know, have you ever been to the ATM on a windy day? You go and you type in the numbers and the money comes out and you, what do you do? You hold it tight, right? Because you don't want the money to go flying. Hold, we hold it close, the things that are important to us. You know, every, most weeks, me um, and my wife, and our, we have two kids, Zeke and Eliana. Zeke is eight, Eliana six. And this week in particular, um, Eliana came up to me and goes, Daddy, let's wrestle. They, my kids want to wrestle with me. And, and it's not really wrestle. Maybe I do throw them around a little bit. I normally start out and I get on, on all fours on top of the bed and they jump on top of my back and we will wrestle. But really, it's, what really it is, it's a tickle fest and a hug fest is really what our wrestling is. I hold tight, my baby girl. I hold tight, my baby boy, because they are important to me. I'm gonna hold them tightly. It's, just, it's a little bit silly, uh, for, maybe for some people here, but when I f- want to get alone and I get by myself and I, w- I want to I feel close to God, I picture myself as a smaller version of myself, whether it be a baby or whatever, whatever it may be. But I picture myself and I picture God, a big God, just holding me and holding me tight. That's how I feel close to God because we hold things that are important to us. We hold it because it's dear to us. You see, as John was speaking to this church in Sardis, he said that most of them were spiritually dead, but there were a few that had it. There were a few that had it. You see, it's amazing what God can do with just a few. It's amazing what God can do with a few. He said, yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. These guys, these are the faithful ones. They will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. I'm here to tell someone today 
that God can do a lot with a few. I'm here to tell someone today that sometimes it just takes one. It just takes one. It just takes one shepherd boy named David to go and defeat the Goliath. It just takes one brave woman, Esther, to stand strong when others caved. It just takes one. It just takes one. You may be the one. You may be the one in your class when you're at school that shows up where none of your friends are Christians, but you show up and you set good examples and you're sharing Jesus with them. You may be just the one. You may just be the one in your family and you're the only Christian in your entire family. You may be the one that knows Jesus and shares Jesus and help those who you love the most know the one that loves them the most. You may be the first one to graduate high school or college from your family. You may be the first one that's debt free in your family. You may be the, the one that stays married when all the rest of your family members, they've all gotten divorced. You may be the one that, that goes and starts that ministry that everyone else is scared to start. We're gonna meet someone like that in just a minute. You may be the one. If you had it and you lost it, I want you to get it back. Remember the psalmist that we talked about at the very beginning? He said, my heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowds of worshipers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. He's asking the question, why am I just discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? And he says this, I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again. What is God telling you here today? God is telling some of you here today, wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. God is telling you here today, wake up. Come on, wake up. Wake up, wake up in your job, wake up in your home, wake up in your church, wake up in your money, wake up in your gifts, wake up in your prayer life, wake your friends up, wake someone up, wake yourself up. Some of you are here today, you've had it, you lost it. I want you to get it back. And if you never had it, I want you to get it for the very first time. So what do you do when you've had it and you've lost it? How do you get it back? You remember it, you finish it, and then you hold it tight. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for the man or woman, the, the teenager that's here today, Father, that has been in a close relationship with you in the past and then over time has drifted away. Father, I pray that you bring them back. I pray that they wake up I pray that they wake up from their slumber. I pray that they will remember the days. I pray that they will finish what they started. I pray that they will obey you and I pray that they will hold you tight, Father. That they will run to you and you will hold them. Give them the courage, Father, to do that. Give them the courage to make a difference. And for the man or woman here today that has never had it before, Father, I pray that you make yourself known to them. I pray that they will see you and experience you in a way that they've never done before. Their lives will be changed. We pray this in your matchless and wonderful name. Amen.